I was in the Army. I was a sergeant in the Army. I was living in the barracks before we got married. And as guys who live in the barracks sometimes will do, we kind of challenge each other. <coughs> I, uh, I became a member of the Fort Benning Sports Parachute Club because somebody dared me. I made four jumps, and then they said the next jump is going to be a static line, and then the one following that will be a free fall. I never went back. Okay, Some of you are braver than I am, but um, I never went back. Another time, we were sitting around the barracks, and one person said, you ever thought about getting a tattoo? And I said, you know, I haven't really thought about it, but wouldn't mind doing it. And so after some lengthy discussion, this friend of mine and I agreed that we were going to go together and we were going to get tattoos, not matching tattoos, but just we were both going to get tattoos. And so, thank you, brother. Um, and so we went to the tattoo parlor, and, uh, and I got my tattoo. It's not a big, fancy one. It's a small one. It just has one word on it. It simply says, Renee. They say, oh. Well, I will tell you that that tattoo, by the way, after I did mine, it was my friend's turn to get his, and he said, no, nah, I changed my mind. I don't him do it. As often will happen. This was just a few weeks before I got married. And so th this is now the week of my wedding. My wedding is going to take place on a Friday night. And I'm sitting on the porch, on the porch swing with my beloved. And I have on, because I'm in Florida, I have on a short sleeve shirt and I reach up to scratch my arm and I raise my arm up a little higher, made my sleeve up a little higher and she sees the tattoo with her name on it. Can I just say we almost didn't get married? <laughs> just being real, we almost didn't get married. You have to understand the context. See, her dad was in the Navy, and her dad had told her all her life, the only people that get tattoos are drunken sailors. And therefore, since I had a tattoo, I must be a drunken sailor, although the logic didn't quite fit since I was in the Army. But you get the point. And so she left the porch. Now, she's 18 years old, okay, still a teenager. She ran in the house crying. Daddy, I can't marry him. <laughs> or something like that. After her father calmed her down, she did agree to go ahead and marry me. <coughs> and from that time on until this time, I have had a tattoo with the word Renee right here on my arm. And she has never liked it. Can I just say that? <laughs> She's never liked it. But you know what? That's okay because... From the time I got the tattoo till this very moment, I was marked. I don't belong to anybody else but her. I have her name on my arm. I could never marry somebody else, because then I would have to go through. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> the point is, is that tattoos now have become quite vogue. They're quite popular. And because of that, a lot of people have tattoos. Probably if I were to take a poll, I, and to get you to raise your hand, probably many of you, maybe most of you in this room, would have a tattoo. I can tell you Renee does not have a tattoo, nor will she ever have a tattoo. But probably many of you do. Tattoos used to only be for drunken sailors, but now lots of people have them. The point of a tattoo is that it's permanent. It is a permanent mark on your body. Mine happens to not be visible most of the time. Um, but many of you have tattoos that are visible. Some of them are very elaborate tattoos. Some of them are very beautiful tattoos. Some of them not so much. Um, some of them perhaps you had when you were younger and you may have regretted getting one of those because your life has changed, your lifestyle has changed. But the point is, is that once you receive that tattoo, you are marked for life by that tattoo. Now, the title of my sermon is, Are You Marked? Obviously, we're not talking about tattoos here, but we're talking about something that is just as permanent as a tattoo would be. 
And that is the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. That's what the subject of today's sermon is about. Are you marked? In other words, what are you known by? Galatians, I'm sorry, Ephesians 1.13 says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 7, verses 17 through 20, it says this, And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? It doesn't look right. I'll read it from there. Even so, every healthy, that is sound tree, bears good fruit, worthy of admiration. But the sickly, decaying, worthless, worthless tree, bears bad, worthless fruit. A good, healthy tree cannot bear bad, worthless fruit, nor can a bad, diseased tree bear excellent fruit worthy of admiration. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Therefore, you will fully know them by their fruits. Okay? We're talking about today the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the fruit of of the Spirit today. And brothers and sisters, if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you are one who has dedicated your life to following Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. And if the Holy Spirit is residing in you, then you are marked by this very presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples that, if, that, that you can tell if someone truly belongs to him by the kind of spiritual fruit that they produced. You know, in our um, politically correct society today, we've been accused as Christians of being judges of people, and sometimes that criticism is well deserved because we tend to look down our nose at other people. We tend to have a holier-than-thou attitude towards other people. <clears throat> but the truth is, Jesus said, if you truly are a disciple of mine, then you will be known by the fruit that you bear. And so, while we should not stand in judgment of anyone, we can certainly observe the fruit that exists in the life of a Christian. Because if you are truly a follower of Christ, that fruit of the Spirit will be obvious to everyone. In other words, if someone were to ask your colleagues at work or your family members if you were a Christian, would they answer yes or no? Would they hesitate and have to stop and think about it? Or would it be an almost instantaneous answer? Yes, of course, he or she is a Christian. Back in the day, the, the, the popular phrase was, if you were brought up on charges for being a Christian, would they find enough evidence to convict you? I, would, I will sadly say that for many Christians today, the answer to that would be maybe not. Because for many Christians, they live their lives incognito. In other words, they claim to be a Christian by their words certain times of the week, like Sunday morning at 10.30, but Monday morning at 9 o'clock, you would never guess that that same person who sat in a worship service and lifted their hands to God was a Christian by the way that they live, by the things that they said and do. Our scripture for today is the passage on the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16, and it reads, But I say, walk by 
by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Listen, no Christian will be easily overcome by the flesh while walking in the Spirit. You need to understand that. If you are truly walking in the Spirit, then you're not going to be overcome by the flesh. But if your walk as a Christian becomes sporadic or it comes to a halt, then you will find yourself in the clutches of the enemy and you will very, very easily find yourself moving back into that place from which God has saved you. We need to understand that. And it talks about the person who is living that way. There are three areas that are mentioned here in this, in this first passage of living for the flesh. And the three areas are sex, worship, and social relationships. Look at verse 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Okay? The works of the flesh are obvious. In other words, it's going to be known. Everybody's going to know what you're about. Okay? And, and, and remember, I said it's in three areas. So the first one of these is sex. Okay? The first one of these is sex. And it says in that verse, in verse 19, it says, go ahead and put that back up, brother. Verse 19. You put that back up. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, okay? These are three things, okay? Listen, you need to understand this, and this is a little bit of adult um, conversation here, but there is nothing inherently evil with the sexual desire. There's nothing wrong with that. In the context of marriage, the sexual desire has a purpose. It is a God-given purpose. Within the context of of the union of husband and wife, the sexual relationship is a good thing created by God. But when And when we yield our sexual desires to the Holy Spirit, it does some incredibly good things. First of all, it enhances the relationship between a husband and a wife. When a husband and a wife come together in marriage, it says the two shall be one flesh, and then that marriage is consummated in that marriage bed. It's a good thing. It is a beautiful thing in the context of marriage. And the second thing that it does is it leads to the birth and nurture of children in the home. A third thing that it does is that it continues to enhance and to increase and improve and nurture the intimate sharing of life where both the husband and the wife are valued and cherished through this act. But if it's under the flesh, it says it leads to sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Let's look at each one of these. Immorality is promiscuous, premarital, and extramarital sexual intercourse. I know that it's not a popular thing to talk about that today, but if you are, are, are not married to someone and you are engaging in sexual relations, with that person, then you are creating for yourself enmity between you and God. God does not ordain sexual relationships outside of marriage. Nor does he ordain additional re sexual relationships that are, 
on the side of a marriage, talking about affairs. God does not honor that. In fact, he says that it's wrong. It's sexual immorality. It's sexual immorality. He also says that it's, that it's impurity, moral impurity, which includes immorality and sensuality. This is where, where you've taken this beautiful thing, this relationship that was designed to be between a husband and a wife, and you've placed it in some other context, and because of that, then, then, then it becomes something that is utterly depraved. It's outside of God's will and God's plan, and therefore it is inherently evil because it's unrestrained by any sense of decency and shame. Verse 20. Let's look at verse 20. We're going to move on. I think we've said enough about that. Idolatry. The second one is worship. Okay? In the context of the Holy Spirit, we worship God. What we do here on Sunday morning is to worship God during our praise and worship time. But if we, if we were to take that concept of worship and place that adoration that we, that we do on Sunday for God onto anything else, it becomes idolatry. In fact, it, in a sense, it becomes something that's very negative. If the desire for worship comes under the control of the flesh, it results in idolatry, which includes sorcery as part of our idolatrous worship. And you say, we don't have any idol worshipers today, do we? We don't have any idol worshipers today, do we? Yeah, we do. They're all over the place. I would, I would dare say that if you were to go to any football game or basketball game, be it co collegiate or professional, you would find a lot of idol worshipers at that game. I'm not saying that being a fan of, of basketball or football makes you an idol worshiper, but if, but if you write, let, let me give you an example. If what you post on Facebook is more about your professional football team or your collegiate basketball team than it is about the things of the spirit, then chances are that you're idolizing that thing. You have whole rituals that you go through. You do. Idolatrous uh, rituals that you go through. Come on, you've seen them. People paint their bodies. You know, they go there where they're naked from the waist up and their body is completely painted with the colors of that team. You've seen them. People that, that are so fanatical that they will do anything. They will, they will take off from work to do it. But you ask them to come and serve in the church and they don't have time because they're, you know, their schedule is very full. They've got lots of things going on, and they just don't have time to do that. Yeah, we have idol worshipers all over the place in the United States. Okay? There are whole channels on television dedicated just to these idols. That's not just professional sports, brothers and sisters. It could be clothing, or it could be cars, or it could be money, or it could be fame, or it could be popularity. Whatever it is, if that has been placed in front of God, and you've been placed over God in your life, then it is for you an idol. And it means that you have subverted the whole purpose of worship, and that is to give glory and honor to the one and only King of kings and Lord of lords. The next thing we see is in social relationships. Now, I understand no man is an island. No man stands alone. We were created by God to be in relationship with someone else. Okay? And if we're controlled by the Spirit then this desire will lead to meaningful relationships and good harmony within the larger community as well as sharing of goods and skills. But what happens to our social relationships when we're controlled by the flesh? Look at the second part of verse 20. Let's put that up there. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, drunkenness, and orgies, envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. Listen, these are all things that these are all things that, that that are involved in your relationship with someone else. Think about each one of these. Enmity. Enmity is a hatred towards someone else. Strife. Strife is disagreement with someone, being at odds with somebody. Go back to that list again. 
Well, go ahead. Let's put them up there. Let's list them. Go ahead and list them. Enmity is quarrels where you're constantly fighting with someone. Strife. Okay, what's the next one? The next one is jealousy. Jealousy is where you, you want something that somebody else has, whether that's, whether that's a house or money or cars or wife or whatever it is, jealous of somebody else. What's the next one? Fits of anger, where you can't control your temperature. Temper, temper, sorry. Where you can't control your temper. Rivalry, where you're putting yourself against someone else, trying to make yourself look better than someone else. What's the next one? Dissensions. Dissensions is where you disagree with someone. You're, 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 in, a, you're in an adversarial relationship with someone. What's the next one? Envy. Envy is, is, is very much like jealousy. It, 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 it causes us to lust after the things that someone else has. It all has to do with our relationship. And then drunkenness and orgies and the such. And the like. Okay? All of these things have to do with relation, social relationships outside the context of the Holy Spirit. Outside of a life controlled by the Spirit. Now, I want us to contrast that picture to the nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And to start that, I want us to watch a video. If you would play that video, brother, and then we'll continue. individually real quick here. The first one of these is love. The first one of these is love. God's word is very clear to tell us that as Christians we will be known by this one characteristic. They will know we are Christians by our love. It's a love for, for God and it's a love for our fellow man, our brothers and sisters in Christ and a love for the lost. Uh, so much so that we have a desire to go to them and to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. The second thing that we see is joy. Joy is, is, is something that, that, that becomes yours the moment of salvation. And nobody can shake it loose from you. Listen, they might steal everything you have, but the, but the world cannot steal your joy. Because it is not couched in the things of the world. You see, we often look at, at the things of the world and say, well, that gives me joy. The things that I have, the possessions that I have, the family that I have, um, um, the, the, the meaningful job that I have, and all of these things, they give me joy. 
But you can lose all of those things in an instant. Read the book of Job if you don't believe me. You can lose all of those things in an instant. And yet, if you're a Christian, you would still have joy because it is so deeply seated in who you are and your identity in Christ that nobody can take the joy of Christ away from you. So joy is the second characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. The third that we see is peace. Peace is a willingness to get along with everyone. Peace means that, that we are not at odds, we're not at enmity, we're not in dissension, we're not in disagreement, we're not quarreling with anyone. But instead, we have learned to be at peace with one another. We are demonstrating the peace of God. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us about that. That, that, that we don't need to worry about anything, but we can have the peace of God which is beyond human understanding because it guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Peace is the third characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. The next one is patience. I don't know about you, but sometimes I lose my patience with people. I don't, I, I'm not, my gift, my spiritual gift is not mercy, okay? And because of that, sometimes... Stupid people make me mad, okay? Can I just say that? Can I just be real? Can I just be transparent? Okay? But you know what? We shouldn't lose our patience even with stupid people, okay? We should show tolerance, not in the sense that we embrace what they're doing that's wrong, but that but we don't, get, we don't allow ourselves to get upset. And I have to be reminded that God is long-suffering and that if we're going to be like Christ, that we need to learn to be long-suffering, which means you don't have to put up with them, but you have to understand them and you have to make allowances for them. Patience. Patience. Long-suffering. The, the root of that is, I mean, the key point of that is long. Long-suffering. Number five is kindness. The word kindness is found alongside patience in several places throughout the Bible. Are you a genuinely kind person? If someone were to ask, were to be asked of you, a friend or family member, if you are a kind person, what would that person say? Would they be able to agree with you? Yes, that she, he or she is a kind person. You display kindness. Does that mean you just simply display kindness to the people that you love, the people that are close to you, your coworkers? No. You display kindness to strangers when you meet them in the marketplace. You display kindness to strangers when you're standing in line and you're getting frustrated because it's taking too long. You're still displaying the sense of kindness. Kindness is a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit that is vital. If we're going to display the mark of a Christian, that is the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The next one goes right along with that. It's the word goodness. <coughs> the Greek word is agathosine, and it appears only four times in the Bible, and it's all in the writings of Paul. And what it means is, and I'm going to read this, it's intrinsic goodness especially as a personal quality, with stress on the kindly rather than the righteous side of goodness, so that we might say that person is genuinely a good person. That, that person is a genuinely good person. Again, I might ask you, are you known to be a genuinely good person? The next one is faithful. In the context here, the word faithfulness here means trustworthy. It means that you're a trustworthy person. Again, I might ask you, if someone were to, dis to, to come to you and ask you, are you a trustworthy person, what would they say? In fact, I would like you to do this with each one of these. Just ask yourself that question. What would they say about me? Would I be someone who's trustworthy? Would I be someone who is faithful in all things? Or am I someone that can't be trusted? The next one of these is gentleness. Gentleness is 
described as gentle strength. Okay? Gentle strength. Let me help you out here. A horse who is tame demonstrates gentle strength. Okay? Because that horse has the ability to trample you and to hurt you. But the fact that you can walk up to it and approach it, and it does not trample you, it does not run you over, it does not hurt you, means that that horse is, is, is demonstrating, is displaying gentle strength. The strength is there, but what's being seen is gentleness. There's a difference between being gentle and being weak. You would never say a horse is weak. We refer to everything that moves as having horsepower. So it has to do with strength. And yet, a horse can be very gentle. And that's the characteristic that we're looking at, gentle strength. The next one is one that many of us struggle with. It's self-control. This describes the inner strength of a person who refuses to be swept away by sudden impulses. Listen, this is absolutely essential if we're going to be free from the control of the flesh in our lives. We have, to, we have to get to the point where we can say no to certain things. We have the, sometimes we refer to it as willpower. We have the willpower to say no to certain things that we know are not good for us. But if you're always giving in to the things that are bad for you, then you have no self-control. And it's so necessary in the life of a Christian because the enemy knows your weaknesses, brothers and sisters. The enemy knows your weaknesses. And the enemy will exploit your weakness every single time he can. Men, if you have a propensity to be weak in the area of, of online pornography, then the enemy is going to put that in front of you every chance he gets. He's going to put you in situations where you are tempted to go online and view this stuff. Ladies, and I may be generalizing here because I know some ladies do that as well, but, 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 but it's primarily men. It's primarily men that do that. Ladies, you can be tempted to do things as well. And, and, and something that we said recently, I don't know if it was in the sermon last week or in the Bible study last week, but every time that we are tempted, it, it's an opportunity to make the right choice. Yeah. It's an opportunity to make the right choice. Self-control. This is important. All of these characteristics of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life are vital if we are going to be known as a Christian. Because we live our lives controlled not by the desires of the flesh, but by this inner presence of the Holy Spirit. Not, and this is, this is where we get into trouble because we feel like if we can just obey the rules, if we can just obey the rules, then we're going to be okay. But you see, being a Christian is not about obeying rules. Being a Christian is being controlled by the Holy Spirit that resides within you. It isn't following some set list of rules that if you do this, you're a good Christian, and if you don't do it, if you break that rule, then you're a bad Christian. The reality is, is that every one of us should be following the rules that society has placed before us to the point where it does not conflict with God's Word. And then it's time for some civil disobedience. Do you speed on the interstate? You're not living within the boundaries set before you. Listen, it's not because, because that's a rule that we shouldn't break. It's because that's how society functions. Is that, is that, is that we are going to do the right thing in every single circumstance. 
every single circumstance. Because we are controlled by the Spirit, not by the things of the flesh. No rule ever changed our life. No rule ever changed our life. It simply points out our flaws. Rules are not meant to make us good. But when we're controlled by the Spirit, when we are controlled by the Spirit, then we're going to be good. It's not our goodness, but it is the righteousness of Christ being displayed in and through us. And while you may have trouble following the rules, that's not what God has called you to do. He didn't call you to follow the rules. And we always say, yeah, what about the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Ten Commandments aren't there for you to be so strict that you follow every one of those. The commandments are there to point out how sinful you really are. Because every one of us has probably broken most, if not all, of the Ten Commandments. So then, there are two things that the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, accomplishes in our lives. And I want to look at these real quick and then we're going to close. The first of these is that, uh, that the, the fruit of the Spirit is what gives you the power to fulfill your destiny in Christ. Listen, Jesus Christ didn't say, come to me and become my follower and now go out and just live the best way that you can. He never said that. He said, look, I don't want you to do anything until the Holy Spirit comes in. I want you to just have a seat and wait for the Holy Spirit. But the minute the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then I want you to go and be my disciples. Go and be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Because it's only when the Holy Spirit comes on you that you have the power to do that, to fulfill your destiny in Christ. You can't do it on your own. If you try to do it by yourself, on your own, you will be a failure, a complete and total miserable failure. You can't do it, and that's why we need Christ's presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us, to do it through us. It's the power that we need in order to accomplish the things that God has called us to do. The second thing that we see is that it's what God uses and this is probably the most important thing. It's what God uses to draw people to himself through you. I want to go back to this for a minute. Because I told you that I, that I lurk on Facebook. Occasionally I post stuff. Hardly ever about me, mostly about the church. But I'm continuously perusing what you all post. And I may lose some friends over this, okay, whatever. Um, but I'm always looking at what you post. And because I'm a pastor and because I've been tasked with your spiritual growth, I'm always, I'm always thinking about the things that you post, the words that you put on that post. Are you building up the kingdom of God or are you displaying things that result of a life that is controlled by the flesh? Teach. Okay? I'm not being legalistic here. I'm just, I'm just asking you to think about this. Because you know what? Some of you, can I just say this? Some of you list on your Facebook wall, on your page, that you work at Living Waters Fellowship. And I don't mind you doing that. I think that's good. Let people know. I put it on mine. If you go to my Facebook page, it says I'm the pastor of Living Waters Community Church, okay? The problem is, is if you put that on there, then everything that you post needs to reflect someone who is in a church who is doing God's work. But if you post stuff that has sexual innuendos, if you post stuff that uses 
foul language, the F word, the S word, and all of those things. If you post stuff that looks bad and puts a negative reflection on Christ, I would just as soon you go and take the word living waters off of that because what you're saying is that you can do anything you want in life and be a member of Living Waters Fellowship, and that's okay. Now, am I stepping on toes? I hope so. Because I want you to stop. I want every time you post something on Facebook, whether it's a picture, whether it's a comment, whether it's, it's a sharing a post that somebody else posted, if it doesn't reflect positively on the kingdom of God, then you don't need to be involved in that. You don't even need to be reading it, much less sharing it with somebody else. Or if you're the one that's the author of it, you don't need to be composing that and posting it on Facebook. Because what you're saying is that this is what a Christian looks like, and that's the reason that so many people don't want to come to church. Because, look, the people in that church aren't any, any different than I am. So why do I need to go to church? That's just a waste of an hour and a half on Sunday morning. You see what I'm saying? So it's what God, the Holy Spirit, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is what God uses to draw people to himself. Do the things that you write on Facebook draw people to God or push people away from God? Please don't answer that out loud, okay? But I want you to think about stuff like that because you never know, ever know, who's watching you. You never know when they're watching you. You never know who it is. Look, I have to go in, uh, more times than once, I have to go in and delete posts that, that appear on my wall because I don't want anybody accidentally checking me out to see what I'm doing and find stuff that you've posted that shows up on my wall, so I have to go in and hide that so I don't even look at it. That's a shame that I should have to do that because what you need to be posting on there, and I'm sorry I'm harping on Facebook, there's lots of others, Twitter and other things like that that you, that you are involved in, and Instagram and all of these things, but they're all conduits, they're all, they're all ways that you can use to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and instead Many of you choose to do just the opposite, to reflect negatively on the things of God by the things that you say and do. I hope that, that my challenge to you today is that you will think about everything that you say and everything that you do and everything that you post and everything that you, that you um, if, if, it is a, if it has a public face on it, that it reflects the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. One last thing, and I'm going to close, and that is, is if the things that I've been talking about, the fruit of the Spirit, are not present in your life at all, or just marginally present in your life at all, the chances are is that the Holy Spirit is not residing in you. Now, there's only one reason the Holy Spirit would not be residing in you, and that is that you are not a child of God. You are not a Christian. Because the Holy Spirit is not a, is not a check the block optional thing when we become a Christian. When we become a Christian, then we receive the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so if your life is reflecting something other than these things, the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about, then what, what that indicates to me anyway, and again, I'm not judging you, I'm simply being a fruit inspector. Okay? I'm simply observing, I'm looking for the fruits, and the fruits, fruits are not present. You know what God says? If a tree doesn't produce good fruits, then it needs to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay? I didn't say it. God said it. Okay? Don't shoot the messenger. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. So if you're not displaying these things, why not? It could be that you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never come to a point where you said, Jesus Christ, I want to follow you. I want to live my life for you. Now, you may think you've done that. You've prayed a prayer or checked a block on a card or, or walked an aisle. But if, but if you're not displaying the, fruits of the, the fruit of the Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is not residing in you. If the Holy Spirit is not residing in you, it's because you're not a Christian. And so many Christians walking around, many people who call themselves Christians walking around today are in fact lost. And doomed to a sinner's hell. This is, not a, this is not a message for you to go and look at other people's lives and say, you know, I don't notice that in that person's life. You know, number three is there, but number five and number six are not there. That's not the purpose of this sermon. 
The only life you need to be looking at is your own life. You need to be doing a self-examination and asking yourself the hard question, am I filled with the Spirit? Am I, is the Holy Spirit residing in me? Am I a child of God? And if you're not, if you're not, then, then, then make that happen today. Don't leave this place today thinking that you're saved and that you're going to go to heaven when you die when in fact your destination is exactly the opposite of that. Now, this has been a harsh sermon, but we're talking about walking in the Spirit. And you cannot walk in the Spirit if the Spirit doesn't exist in your life. And so we've got to go all the way back to square one and say, are you saved? Are you a child of God? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I can't answer that for you. This is for you to, to look at your own life and to make that determination. But I will tell you that today you can start, you can make that a reality in your life. You can receive the Holy Spirit today. And when you do, the fruit of the Spirit become the mark, the permanent mark of God's presence.